Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Hello, I'm Marina Yavshan, your host of the Russia-Ukraine War Report Podcast, and today is October the 11th, 2024. It has been 3,910 days since Russia started covert military operations in Crimea, 10 years and 233 days since the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, 2 years and 130 days since Russia expanded its war of aggression, and 67 days since Ukraine counter-invaded Russia. Today's podcast covers the events that happened on Thursday and Friday morning. Our Russia-Ukraine war map is a great companion to the podcast, and there is a link in the podcast description. There are map updates today. The Russia-Ukraine War Report is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from our direct contacts and journalists in Ukraine, the Russian Ministry of Defense, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine Morning Reports, Operational Commands North, South and East of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geospatial experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian male bloggers and social media channels with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission, the truth, because the truth matters. Here is my daily assessment. 1. In our assessment, Colonel General Ramzan Kadyrov's declaration of a blood feud against oligarchs and State Duma deputies has created a minor risk of destabilizing the Russian government, particularly the regional governments of the Caucasus. 2. Without a major event such as the use of seaborne weapons, Russian forces won't recapture the Kursk region of Russia or capture Chasiv Yar, Toretsk, New York, Murnograd, Pokrovsk, Kurahova, and Selidova by autocrat Vladimir Putin's October 15th deadline. 3. Russia has increased the number of mechanized attacks in Ukraine, but in our assessment, most of the reserves prepared for 2024 have been deployed, reducing Russia's ability to turn breaches into tactical successes. Grants with guns take territory, grants with guns hold territory. 4. Due to increasing indications that Moscow is finding it increasingly difficult to maintain the current operational tempo, Russian troops are attempting to advance as far as possible before fall and winter weather arrives. 5. We maintain Moscow does not have or will not commit a sufficiently large enough force to liberate the Ukrainian-occupied parts of the Kursk Oblast. 6. Continued nuclear threats from Moscow highlight how the world remains caught in the mutually assured destruction instability paradox. 7. The lack of a meaningful response by Ukraine's allies and international organizations to open and unrestricted attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure by Russia has convinced Moscow this is an effective strategy with no political consequences. 8. Russia will maintain its attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure, continuing Russian crimes against humanity that started in October 2022, as outlined in four arrest warrants issued by the International Criminal Court. The continued attacks are increasing the probability of a nuclear accident at one or more of Ukraine's nuclear power plants due to a loss of external power connections. 9. The policy of escalation management implemented by the NATO alliance and the United States is a complete failure that has only encouraged Russia to escalate hybrid and kinetic warfare actions against the NATO alliance and Ukraine's allies and their economic interests. 10. The Russian economy is much weaker than reported. 11. We maintain there could be a shift in Washington's policy toward Ukraine's request for deep strikes within Russia after the November 5th national elections in the United States. Yesterday, Russia carried out 169 discrete assaults, and through October 10th, the seven-day moving average for daily attacks increased to 160. In the Kursk region, Ukraine controls 922 square kilometers, with another 306 in the gray zone, for a total area of 1,228 square kilometers. Russia launched a second counteroffensive, which caused today's reduction, but the outcome remains unclear. Ready for today's action report? Here we go. Starting in the Kursk region of Russia near Koreneva, Russian forces launched a second counteroffensive, utilizing up to 30 armored vehicles. 
East of Koreneva, a Russian infantry fighting vehicle was forced to navigate around a cluster of wrecks before heading east, passing several previously undocumented losses. At least two armored vehicles reached the critical Ukrainian logistical hub of Zelyony Shlach before being repulsed by tanks, an advance of over four kilometers. It is unclear how successful the advance was and the state of territorial control. Ukraine continues to maintain tight operational security, enabling Russia to control the narrative. Sentinel-2L2A satellite images from October 10 were taken during the Russian advance, capturing the combat-related fire on the northern edge of Zelyony Shlach. We expected to see more fires, which would indicate the offensive had artillery support. All of the videos showing the Russian advance were recorded by drone and only showed one Russian soldier near Koreneva falling out of an armored personnel carrier. The lack of light infantry, flag raisings, claims of Ukrainian troops captured, and no videos showing fighting from the ground raises questions about Russia's ability to consolidate the gains, or if there were any gains. The advance deep into Ukrainian-controlled Kursk Oblast is undeniable, and Zelyony Shlach sits at a vitally important crossroads. The ground lines of communication, or GLOG, that's a supply line to Lyubimovka, west toward Koreneva and Olgovka, north to Kalinov, and northeast to Malaya Loknya, connect in the village. In our assessment, if we were sitting in Moscow with the general staff of the Russian Federation Armed Forces, capturing Zelyony Shlach would be a key operational goal. The latest Sentinel-2 pass did not show any indications of continued fighting in the area of Bakhova. Based on Russia's recent success in Abukhovka, we coded Bakhova as under Russian control – we had considered it contested – and moved the grey area east to Abukhovka. We also moved a significant area along the Koreneva-Sudja highway from east of Koreneva village to just north of Zelyony Shlach into the grey area. We kept Olgovka and Vedrina under Ukrainian control. If Russian troops have captured the area to Zelyony Shlach, a Ukrainian withdrawal from Olgovka is likely. At the time of publication, there were reports of continued fighting in the area of Nova Ivanovka. Complicating our ability to assess the battlefield, Ukraine recently captured a full squad of Russian soldiers and recovered an intact R-448 satellite terminal. I told you about the R-448 yesterday. This information would suggest that Ukrainian forces advanced in a different location within the Kursk Oblast. Since the start of October, there has been almost no information from the Glushkovsky district, and the last clear satellite pass was on September the 25th. During today's satellite pass, Novy Put, Abukhovka, that's the one by Glushkova, Vesola and Medvezhia were completely obscured by clouds. General Oleksandr Sirsky, commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Ukraine, told Ukrainian public broadcaster Suspilne that Russia was forced to redeploy approximately 50,000 troops to the Kursk Oblast from parts of Ukraine, particularly from the Kharkiv, Kramatorsk, Zaporizhia and Kherson fronts. Quote, this, of course, made it easier for us to conduct defensive operations. Moving to assessment. While Russia has made significant tactical advances since February 2024, the capture of Vuhledar has been the only operational goal achieved. Ukrainian commanders continue to report that most breaches of their defenses have occurred during poorly executed troop rotations or other preventable errors. I've told you about the slowed operational tempo, particularly in northern Kharkiv oblast, west of Svatove, at Chasiv Yar, and in the Zaporizhia oblast and the Kherson oblast. It's the main reason I'm only focusing on where the battlefield changed. It is also noteworthy that Russian advances in Toretsk and New York not only slowed after August the 6th, but, in the case of New York, were reversed. One of Kyiv's expectations from invading the Kursk region of Russia, they could prove to their allies that Moscow's nuclear threats were hollow. At the time I recorded today's podcast, the key nations to convince – the United States, the United Kingdom and Germany – remain wary of escalation that could expand the war. We maintain our assessment that goes back to March 2022. Continued appeasement all but assures a continental war. You don't give the playground bully your lunch money. You punch them in the nose, in front of the school.
Here is what happened in my home Ukraine. Despite carrying out 169 attacks from the Kharkiv Oblast to the Kherson Oblast, there were no significant changes to the line of conflict. In the Kharkiv Oblast, in Petropavlivka, a Russian sabotage and reconnaissance squad occupied a home on the eastern edge of the settlement, came under attack, and all but two were eliminated. The surviving Russian soldiers surrendered to Ukrainian troops and were taken prisoner without incident. There was no change to the map. In the Luhansk Oblast, west of Svatova, the line of conflict was adjusted north of Stelmahivka, recording a small Russian advance. Near Siversk, multiple Russian male bloggers walked back earlier claims of Russian forces capturing Grigorivka and Verkhnyokamyenske and a claimed advance to Serebrenka. Russian channel military informant wrote, quote, It is reported that the appearance of data on non-existent advancement was connected with manipulations of the local leadership, which engaged in flag-sticking where there were no real major successes, unquote. Russian mercenary mail blogger Rybar was harsher, correctly assessing that quote, a false report on the capture of a particular location not only misinforms the higher command and contributes to the adoption of erroneous decisions, but also cuts off its own combat capabilities. For Russia, future advances in these directions will be conducted by light infantry with little artillery support and no close air support. Why would senior commanders authorize an airstrike on an area they believe is already behind Russian lines? Rybar continued, stating, quote, And this, in turn, entails losses of personnel and equipment, which, contrary to the beliefs of some people, tend to run out very quickly when used thoughtlessly. Our team made numerous geolocations in Toretsk, which confirmed the existing line of conflict. The most intense fighting continues to be in the area of schools number no. 6 and number no. 9. In the southwestern part of the Donetsk Oblast, Russian forces made marginal gains in western Mikhailivka. Overnight, in occupied Crimea, at the fuel depot in Feodosia, there was a massive explosion, with local residents reporting another tank caught fire. When the sun rose this morning, the fire had burned itself out, with only light smoke coming from the site. The Crimean Tatar insurgent organization Atesh reported that Russian logistics are, quote, a mess. Long convoys of military fuel trucks are now being used to maintain military operations, with Russian troops changing locations every 12 hours to prevent drone and missile attacks. Russia attacked the city of Odessa, striking a commercial building in a residential area, killing four, including a 16-year-old girl, and wounding ten. Yesterday I told you about the Libyan-owned and Panamanian-flagged bulk carrier Sally M, possibly being the ship hit by a Russian missile on October the 6th. AIS data showed that the vessel departed Pivdenny under its own power and sailed with its transponder off after leaving Ukrainian territorial waters to an anchorage near Sulina, Romania. This morning the vessel left its anchorage, sailed briefly toward Sulina, drifted for hours, and then traveled at four to six knots into the Danube River Canal. When Russia attacked the South Korean-owned Panamanian-flagged Shui Spirit container ship two days ago, it was in the process of being loaded with humanitarian aid for the Palestinian territories. Forty-five cargo containers of edible sunflower oil were destroyed. Oleg Kiper, head of Odessa Oblast military administration, reported that another civilian had died from their injuries, raising the death toll to eight. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers and analysts is funded by readers, listeners and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News. Here is today's theater-wide update. I am saddened to announce that our colleague at Ukrainska Pravda, freelance journalist Viktoria Roshchina, died on September the 19th while in Russian captivity. She was 27. Roshchina was traveling to the occupied territories through Russia while on assignment. 
She crossed the border on July 27, 2023, and was last heard from on August 3 of the same year. In May of 2024, Russia finally admitted she had been detained, with the International Committee of the Red Cross documenting her imprisonment. Jean Cavalier, the head of Reporters Without Borders Eastern Europe and Central Asia desk, condemned Victoria Roshina's detainment and death. Quote, the Russian authorities have never provided any information about her detention, despite repeated requests from her family, the Ukrainian authorities and RSF. They must shed light on all the circumstances surrounding her detention and death. It was reported that she was going to be part of an upcoming prisoner exchange. Victoria Roshina was passionate, talented, and loved her country. There are at least 20 Ukrainian journalists still imprisoned by Russia for doing their job, finding, reporting, and defending the truth. She is the 98th journalist killed since February 24, 2022. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is on a whirlwind tour of Europe, presenting his victory plan. Speaking in Paris with his French counterpart Emmanuel Macron, Zelensky denied reports that Kyiv was open to negotiating a land for peace deal with Moscow. Yesterday, the Ukrainian leader also met with British Prime Minister Keir Starmer and NATO Secretary General Mark Rutte. He then travelled to Italy, meeting with Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni, and at the time of recording, he was at the Vatican for an audience with Pope Francis. Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic signed a declaration during the Southeast European summit in Dubrovnik, Croatia, condemning Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, surprising Eastern European political experts. The statement said in part, quote, We strongly condemn the unprovoked, unjustified and illegal Russian aggression against Ukraine. Russia's aggressive war is a crime against the Ukrainian people, a gross violation of international law as well as a serious threat to the peace, security and stability of Southeastern Europe, the entire European continent and the world. Vucic said that he was able to have changes made to the statement by participating in the summit and that he and Serbia fully support the territorial integrity of Ukraine. NATO will conduct its annual nuclear exercises, steadfast noon, starting on October 14th. The drill will involve more than 2,000 personnel and 60 aircraft from 13 nations, operating from eight air bases, running through October 28. While the aircraft involved are capable of delivering nuclear warheads, the drill will not use live weapons. Secretary-General Rutte said, quote, Nuclear deterrence is the cornerstone of allied security. Steadfast Noon is an important test of the Alliance's nuclear deterrent and sends a clear message to any adversary that NATO will protect and defend all allies. Before you go digging your backyard bunker, this was a pre-planned exercise, and NATO carries out its annual weapons training every October. Chechen warlord and aspiring dentist Colonel General Ramzan Dondon Kadyrov's declaration of a blood feud was not just empty words. Russian authorities reported an assassination attempt on an assistant to an unnamed State Duma deputy from Ingushetia in the Moscow suburb of Odinsova. Former deputy PM of Ingushetia Shiri Palihadzhiev was in his home when the would-be assassin fired four shots. Ali Hadjiev called his wife and then the police. Local officials reported that he was taken to the hospital as a precautionary measure, where doctors discovered he had been shot twice. He was sent to emergency surgery and, at the time of publication, was in critical condition. The shooting came less than 24 hours after Kadyrov declared a blood feud against current and former State Duma deputies from Dagestan and Ingushetia for an alleged assassination plot. We didn't expect yesterday's assessment to age like fine wine this quickly. The British newspaper The Guardian reported that dozens of North Korean military engineers had been deployed in occupied Ukraine, assisting Russian troops in operating and programming targeting information into KN-23 short-range ballistic missiles. Svetlana Razvorotneva, the deputy chairperson of the State Duma Committee on Construction and Housing and Utilities, 
reported that Russia is facing a critical shortage of cemeteries and recommended privatizing the industry. At this time, there are no reports of her falling out of a window for saying this out loud. Russian Telegram accounts have shared pictures and videos of military cemeteries already in disrepair. A recent video that we linked to in today's situation report showed cows wandering through a cemetery, eating the flower arrangements left on the fresh graves. In September, mortgage applications in Russia crashed, dropping 61% most of a month. Additionally, the Central Bank of Russia removed the cap on mortgage rates, enabling banks to price future paper on risk. The rule change will further increase mortgage interest rates, which currently average around 21%. And that's what we know. Join me again on Monday, and we'll do it all over again. Your support of my home, Ukraine, helps us make history and protect the future for all. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.